My name is Siki Felix. Thank you for trying to butcher my name back here. It's not Siki. It's not Mitsubishi. <laughs> Tsitsiki. I was born and raised in Michoacán, Mexico, before coming to the U.S. Um, I've been here for quite some time, but I arrived here in the U.S. when I was about your age. I was 15 years old. Right now, I anchor newscasts, and I've been doing this for a long time already. I'm not going to say for how long, to be honest. I live in Washington, and I do the 6 p.m., the 11 p.m., every day. It's a little tough sometimes. It's a very demanding job, but I love what I do. I get to interview senators. I get to interview congressmen. I get to interview and make sure that the questions are asked and that I get the answers that we need. I love what I do. In fact, I get to do debates. I've moderated senatorial debates that have placed important people that make decisions that impact your life and my life on a daily basis. So it's pretty cool. So that's one shot from Noticias Univision Washington, and that's um, something that I constantly do. And um, I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of uh, questions and debates. I moderate. I also get to do a lot of events where I present uh, governors and uh, moderating different subjects that impact our daily life. For instance, I went to a summit talking about social justice, talking about the equality, and how women nowadays still, believe it or not, still nowadays still make 60 to 80 cents per every dollar that you boys are making. I'm not a hater. I just want equality. I want to make as much money as you do whenever you grow up. Right? Don't we? I think it's important, and that is exactly what we're talking about today here. So I was covering the, the, the conventions. I was at the Republican convention, at the Democratic convention, and boy, was it hell. And what I mean by that is such a difference when it comes to knowing how every single people, person here in the U.S. thinks. We're all different. Our interests are different. The decisions that take place constantly at the White House, at the Capitol, are all different, and they impact every single one of us constantly. I was born and raised in Mexico, Michoacán, Mexico, to be specific. That's my family. I'm the cute one in the bottom. Boy, was I cute right? That's my mom, my dad, by the way, he's right here in the audience. Dad, where are you? Raise your hand. There you are. Thank you. <laughs> so I was born in Mexico into a family that we were middle class. We were very united, very religious, and what I thought was indestructible. I had a very nice childhood. I was very happy. Mexico is a great country, and I thought I had the best family, the best time in my life. Things changed. I moved to the U.S. with my parents, my mom, my dad, and my three little sisters. I overstayed my visa, and we all became undocumented for years. We started living off of shelters. We didn't have money to buy clothes. We went from shelter to shelter to try to find food, drinking expired milk, getting boys' clothes to wear, even though I'm a girl. And I would go to high school, try to go to high school to learn the language. And I was ashamed because I was wearing boys' clothes and we didn't have money. I was ashamed to go to shelter to shelter to try to survive with my mom because my dad had gone back to Mexico at that time. Things in Mexico were not doing too good, by the way. So what we did, we started working at a factory. My sister and I were getting up at 6 in the morning every day. And we were trying to take the metal out of the airplane parts. My mom would work with us. Still, we did not make enough money to pay the rent for a single room. We were getting paid under the minimum wage because we weren't documented. And that was my reality. So I found myself trying to dream about donuts every day because that was my only consolation, the only sweet that I thought about. And I had no network. I had no friends. I did not know the language. I was afraid of eyes of immigration. It was cold. I didn't have clothes to wear to go to school. We had no food. 
And this box of donuts that you see right here in the image was $1.99. And that was a crucial moment that I can remember right now. I have two little sisters. One of them is, at that time, five years old. The other one was four years old. I was 15, and my other sister was 14. We didn't have money to eat. So that was what we, we could afford. Get that, bo that box of donuts for $1.99 at night so that we could feel ourselves. I don't have to tell you more. It was a tough time, definitely. It was rough. Um, we ended up going to school, working full time. I became a waitress. I was working at a McDonald's. I was trying to go to ESL classes to try to learn the language. And um, it was not easy, but I became a news anchor here in, this, in, what, in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago, right? I'm in Chicago. <laughs> a few hours ago, I was in DC. And I was here for about 15 years. I was happy, I was um, accomplished, and um, I thought that I had overcome every single hardship that anybody can accomplish. I've always been very optimist. I've tried to be responsible. I've tried to do things the right way. And um, what was in Telemundo, Chicago, I had a great time. And I was always trying to make sure that I did my job the right and the best way. However, I always had the little interest in me to become an entrepreneur. So I decided to launch my makeup line after I finished my work with Telemundo. I was very excited. I launched my makeup line and I thought I had everything under control again. One more time in my life, I was happy. My childhood was great, but I was happy again. And the reason I'm sharing with you this story is because the origins when I came to the US is just like every single one of you with the exception of you guys here in the front, which are older, 20, 25, right? But most of you are 15 years old, 16, 17. I wish somebody would have told me what I was supposed to expect in life and how to accomplish my goals. Nobody did. So I went ahead and tried to pursue my dream to become an entrepreneur. But when I was an entrepreneur, I became overwhelmed. And I'm sure a lot of you guys feel the same way. When you have a lot of decisions, when you've taken risks without calculations, without informing yourself the right way, everything can be blurry and everything can be tough, more than you would have thought. So by the time I launched my makeup line, I decided that I was going to do great. So the perceived adrenaline that I was living through day to day, I was actually getting lost in myself. I was getting overwhelmed by decisions, sad, exhausted. Very few things will give me calm. Very few things will comfort me. I was mentally paralyzed. I don't know if you guys feel that at some points in your lives. When your mind cannot go forward, when you cannot even make a simple decision as to what you're gonna have for dessert because your mind is overwhelmed and saturated. That's how I felt. Everybody around me thought, oh, Tatiki, she's got it done. She's an entrepreneur. Her makeup line is doing great. Oh wow, look at all the boutiques, they're all interested. But deep down, I felt lost and scared. I was in a very long-term relationship at the time, and despite my intentions, it kept failing. And I was emotionally drained at the same time. All the tension that I had accumulated started to wear me out to the point that I could not even get up in the mornings. And I kept asking myself, what did I do so wrong to feel this way? How could someone like me, who has overcome adversity in so many aspects in my life, still crying herself to sleep and not being able to get up the next morning to go on and make simple decisions on a daily basis? So what I did, I learned again. And this is what I can share with you. I learned the hard lessons. The first one is you have to learn to say no. When people are asking you to do things, it's easy to say yes. No, say no. That creates space in your life. And that space allows you to do other things that you're supposed to get on that will make you stronger and more successful. You have to build a network. Yeah, 
I have a lot of friends, quote unquote, acquaintances, people that I know, people that know me, but I had no real network. I had not chosen the people that I wanted to pursue my dreams with. I surrounded myself with people, but not a close network that will actually support me and be there for me at those times when I felt lost and scared. You have to prep and plan. Doesn't matter how great you're doing right now. Prepare, plan, make sure that you have a plan B. And if you don't have a plan B, make sure that you have a plan C. And if the plan C doesn't work, then go to Z. Doesn't matter, but always have something next for you. What helped me overcome this latest episode in my career, in my personal life, hardship, was also to compartmentalize. Did I say that right? Compartmentalize? Well, that's a tough word. I like it though. Why? Because we are very organized at, at home, at work, but our minds are constantly going. And I don't know about you all, but I, I'm constantly thinking. My mind doesn't stop. And instead of going from one place to the next, to the next, to the next, we gotta stop, take a step back, and think, how do I make my life better? By saving energy, more than anything, and going to the next step. Scratch the stuff that you've already taken care of. And make sure that you focus your energy and everything that you're thinking about on the things that are crucial at the moment. Don't clutter yourself. The most important thing is don't ever give up. That's crucial. And I'm no expert on this, but I can tell you that there were many times that I said, I don't know if I can go on. I'm too sad. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. There is nothing else for me. More important, you know how I felt? Ashamed that people will realize what a failure I was at this stage in my life. Don't ever let that happen because adversity is always going to come back in life. If we don't have adversity in our lives, we're not going to become stronger. I'll give you an example. The person next to you, if they've gone through more hardship than you have, they're stronger than you. So look at it that way. The more failures that you have make you a better, stronger, and more prepared person for your future. And at the end, you will be more successful than the rest. Now this takes me to this subject, immigration. By the way, I, I brought my phone to take a selfie right now because I see a lot of people from different places here, which I love. Immigration is important to me and it's in my heart because US, America, is great because of immigrants. We enrich the culture. We are here because this is our country and we make it better. We contribute to this country. In fact, every single one of you, and I mean the students, just the fact that you're here today, you're a hero because you're in school, because you're pursuing your dreams. I wish somebody would have told me when my family and I were struggling and trying to survive when we came to this country, stay in school, don't stop. Nobody did. And while, while we were trying to survive and put some food on the table, I dropped out of high school. Don't make that mistake. That is the first lesson that I can share with you. If you get something out of today, please don't stop educating yourself, going to school, learning what you can do. That is important. U.S. is a land for immigrants. A lot of here, the people here are immigrants. Our parents are immigrants. I was born and raised in Mexico. Heck, our president's two wives are immigrants. You guys know that, right? They're immigrants. <laughs> this is our country. And I think we should be proud of the richness of the culture. Steve Jobs' father was an immigrant. The co-founder of Google was an immigrant. Yes, Google. Einstein was an immigrant. And this astronaut, Jose Hernandez, from Michoacán, Mexico, where I was born, his parents were immigrants. Aren't we proud? These are the people that make America great. These are the people that are enriching our lives, that make all of us better as well. 
and we are part of that. I felt the pain of immigration. That's my brother-in-law, my sister's husband. That's my nephew, Hector. He was married to my sister, who was already a US citizen. My nephews were born here in the US. He ended up being deported. My nephews have grown without a father for such a long time. It is unacceptable. And I don't mean that criminals should stay in the country. Absolutely not. But the recent changes in immigration are inhumane. They shouldn't be. Something that is also touching my heart is every day I'm reporting on cases on people that are not talking about crimes because fear. The LAPD chief, chief, did I say it right? 25% um, the crime has gone down in LA. Wow, that's great news. Well, it's not. What's actually happening is that people are fearful to deport or report a crime out of fear of deportation. That's what's actually going on. Women are getting raped. They're quiet about it. Kids are getting abused. Nobody's saying anything. There's a lot of injustices going on, not just in LA, every single place. They're not being reported out of fear of deportation. I was here in Chicago, in Telemundo, and um, we covered a story where there were three adult men from different countries. I cannot remember the countries that they were different from Latin America. And uh, they called because they wanted to report a crime, which was sexual harassment, on all of them, by the owner of the company that they worked for. These were the main breadwinners of the family. They had the responsibility to care for the family, and they were being victims of sexual harassment. And they did not want to report the crime because they were afraid, but most of all, they were ashamed of what they were going through. These are things that are not fair, that we need to stand up, that we need to speak up, that we need to make sure that we bring them to light so people know that these people who are not criminals, who are here earning, making a life, and making America great, are not going through this situation. I ended up going to their house and I found three men with tears in their eyes, ashamed of themselves, not being able to speak to me and look at me in the eyes because they were fearful that I, a reporter, will be called about their situation and called immigration on them. Now having said this, brings me to this subject, freedom of the press, the importance of the media, the importance to speak up, how crucial it is for every single one of us see, sitting here and hearing about this to do something about it. Freedom of the press is crucial. And the reason for that is because without it, there is no accountability. Everybody does whatever they wanna do. I'm talking about people that have the power, people that have the money, people that make decisions across my work in the White House, at the Capitol, they make those decisions. And we are pretty much paralyzed if we don't speak up and if the press do not ask the right questions. That's the White House. And I work right across the Capitol, just like crossing the street. The Capitol is right there. That's where everything's happening constantly, where all decisions are taking place, where all the questions are being asked, but many of them right now, at this time, this month, this year, are not being answered. Without transparency, there cannot be justice. Now, I'm a journalist, and I'm gonna tell you why I became a journalist. You see that picture? That's a mountain, a little bit of a little mountain where uh, the transmitter of the radio station that I was working at when I came to the US. I was about 15, 16 years old that I had gotten my first job as a radio host and um, still undocumented, by the way. And I was working at a, fact, at, a, at a radio station like that one. It was dark every night because I would start working at midnight and I would get up at five in the morning 
In the day, I will work at the factory. In the afternoon, I will try to go to high school and learn English. So that image shows you a place where everything was clear to me. How many of you know what you want to do? Like perfectly, that you have it very figured out. Okay. How many of you don't know and have no clue? Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. I was there. Okay. That's good. I was 16, maybe. Can remember. I was exhausted every night. I was tired because I was working too much and I was trying to finish high school. I was trying to learn language and I was trying to make money at the factory. So I will fall asleep every night, play the music, fall asleep again, play the music. I was alone. It was a place, without exaggerating, this big. Two meters by two meters. That's what I will do every night, my presentation on the radio. Every single night, the phone was ringing, but I would not have the energy to pick it up. I did not want to talk to anyone. I was depressed. Finally, one night, I decided I'll pick it up. The, the line kept ringing and ringing and ringing. I said, okay, God damn it, let's do this. Fine, let me see who it is. Well, I'm going through my own frustration as a teenager and trying to figure out my own life as a new immigrant here in the U.S., finally picked up the line. And there was a voice on the other end of a woman who said, you finally picked it up. I've been calling you nonstop every night for the past month. My name is so-and-so. I'm 25 years old. I'm pregnant. I'm eight months pregnant. And she was crying. So that's when she got my attention. You're the only person that I listen to every night. You're the only friend that I have here. I fear for my life because my husband hits me. And I don't know what to do. You're the only person that I listen to. That pivotal moment is what this made me decide that the press, this microphone right here in front of me, this monitor right there, my newscast is crucial. It's not a privilege. It's not a gift. It's not an entitlement. It's a responsibility. The responsibility to inform, to give facts, to be truthful, to speak up, to stand up, to rise up when you see an injustice, when you don't see transparency. After that, I decided to do what I do now to be a voice for those that cannot have a voice. That image right there killed seven people this year in the Washington, D.C. area. Two of them were two minors, one nine years, nine year old, another one was seven years old. Univision Washington, my team, we covered the story nonstop, every day. The people that lived in this building did not know how to speak English. They had been reporting constantly gas leaks for months. Nobody listened to them. We were there, and I was witnessing the pain of a father losing their brothers, their sisters, and their little ones. I was there talking to a woman, telling me, how she was inside the room. Imagine you're sitting right there, you right there in the middle. And this place opens up with a lot of fire. You're holding your mom's hand. And while you're looking at your mom, you fall down, you die, and your mom is the last one that sees you alive. That's what happened to those seven people. The building crashed, exploded because of a negligence. Because no one spoke up, nobody said anything, nobody paid attention to it. So thanks to the efforts of Univision Washington, and this is the reason that I feel proud of what we do. That's the reason that you should feel proud every single time you stand up, you rise up, and you speak up. Because of that coverage, nobody had done anything. Nobody spoke English, so they could not even be interviewed about what happened. We were able to bring light to this darkness, and now there is an investigation and a lawsuit.
that hopefully will bring some justice to all those families that were affected by this explosion at the Flower Branch Apartments in Washington, D.C. You guys recognize this picture? No, amigos, ¿qué pasó? Really? Okay. I'll tell you what happened there. After telling you how important it is for the freedom of press, the importance of the media to ask the questions and get the answers for you, not for me, for you, it's also important to recognize fake news. Yes, the F word that is being very used right now, fake news, left and right. There was a man that showed up in Washington, D.C., armed. He showed up at this place because he had read on the internet and the social media that you're constantly checking day in, day out, day out about a ring, sexual trafficking of kids. He believed the story. Like many of the stories that you believe on the internet, which are not true, which are actually fake news. He showed up. He's in jail. He attacked. People could have been hurt. What happens then is we have to take control over what we do. I'm a journalist, yes, I'm a news anchor. I host a national show on politics. I ask questions. Some of them don't, don't get answered, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I don't like saying the truth because the truth is there, but I have to say the truth, even if I don't like it. That's my job. I want you guys to do the same job. You don't have to be in front of a camera because you have a phone, you have a, a camera. You have a microphone when you speak to your friends. You have the power to put the light where the injustices are happening. And you can be your own reporters. So I ask you to do that. It's crucial nowadays with everything that's going on. And this brings me to the power of light, guys. We talk about hardship, failure, and how it's important to stand up, get up, continue walking. Despite the adversity, we all go through it. I'll go through it again, I'm sure. What's important is that you use the lessons that life has taught you. Once you learn that the power of light is there with you, and I'm not getting religious, there is no religious about anything about this. I was last year in Utah after visiting my mom in Vegas with my sisters. We ended up Going camping. How many of you guys have gone camping? You like it? Okay, that was my first time, actually. I loved it. And the reason I'm sharing this picture with you is because this is exactly what I was looking at in my mom's RV. I was in the bed reflecting about adversity, my challenges, my life, what I had accomplished, what I have not accomplished my failures, and as I'm driving, not me, they're driving, I'm looking at the stars. What a humbling experience. I didn't need that much light or the whole road to be lit for me to enjoy what I was doing. It was just a little bit of light that allowed me to see the biggest stars I've ever seen. I saw families of deers by the road as we were driving in silence in the forest. Everything else was dark. That's what light does for you. It illuminates the darkness, and it doesn't have to be the long way. You don't have to see the end of your life already lit. You just need to see the present and what you're going through in the next few weeks, months, years. Of course, not years, but close to that. Now, that's the kind of light that made me reflect about my adversity, my challenges, and what I was doing with myself. But there's another kind of light that I want you guys to pay attention to. The light that illuminates the darkness in other people. And only you have the power to do that. Nobody else. You're the new generation. You're the future of this country. It is up to you. How do you do it? By being persistent. By recognizing that this country is ours. That we have to make sure it goes the right direction. That we embrace what we do. And that we do it with the right way. 
keep your family safe, keep your friends close, prep, declutter, compartmentalize when you need to, and make sure that you become the voice of those that can't. Being indifferent to injustices is not acceptable, guys. It's not. Being insensible to other people's pain is not acceptable. It's not. We have to be the voice of those that don't have a voice. There's a lot of people out there that don't have what you have, which is the education, which is the perseverance, the dedication, and the vision to become leaders in this world. So I leave it up to you to recognize the power of light. Thank you. Gracias. Keep up the good work, okay? Yes, yes, and yes.